Hello and welcome back to Tharik Learns and Plays Mordheim City of the Damned. In our last video we finished off our last combat tutorial, so now we can get started on the tutorials for the hideout management. And we will start with the warband management. Hopefully these will be shorter and it looks like it's just text, so let's get through them. First we've got Hire Warriors. In this screen you may hire warriors to bolster your warband. There are four types of warriors. Leader, Hero, Impressive and Henchman. Your warband must always have one leader and three other warriors to take part in a mission and cannot have more than ten active warriors at the same time. If you hire an impressive warrior it will take the place of two heroes and reduce the maximum number of active heroes of active warriors to nine. Be, nine, be mindful when hiring warriors, since henchmen can be hired into hero slots, but the opposite is not true. Okay, so uh, we can assume that impressive warriors are better than just henchmen, since they take up more space, so to speak. So I assume we have to find a balance between... Uh, quality and quantity with this. Next is pay upkeep. After each battle you must pay upkeep for each warrior that took part in the mission. Unpaid warriors will refuse to join a mission until they are paid. You can also wait to pay their upkeep if you are low on funds but their fee will accrue interest every day. After seven days of being unpaid a warrior will take their equipment and leave the warband forever. While warriors remain unpaid, they cannot be customized, their equipment cannot be modified, and they cannot learn skills or spells. Okay, so there is the element of money we have to keep in mind when dealing with our warband. So we always have to have enough money, apparently. Next is pay treatment. When a warrior falls out of action and gains a permanent injury, it will also require a treatment cost. The cost must be paid in warband management in the warband management section in order to start the recovery process. An injured warrior has increasing chance to die every day the treatment is left unpaid. If a warrior dies this way, their equipment will be returned to your inventory. While warriors are recovering, they cannot be customized, their equipment cannot be modified, and they cannot learn skills or spells. Okay, so characters or warriors that are injured need to be treated. Sounds logical. We could apparently also fire warriors. If you feel a warrior no longer has place has a place in your warband, they can be fired from this screen. A fired warrior will be unequipped of their items before leaving. Take note that you cannot fire an unpaid warrior or one that requires medical treatment. You can only fire warriors that are ready for battle. Okay, so we can't avoid actually paying them. <coughs> warband reserve. Each warband has a reserve for warriors ready to fight but are uh, for warriors ready to fight but are not in the active warband these warriors can be helpful when someone of your warriors uh, when some of your warriors are out of action for several days due to injury or the training of new skills as long as they they do not take part in a mission these warriors will not require any upkeep as your warband increases in rank more reserve and warband slots will become available Unavailable warriors. Warriors become unavailable due to the following reasons. Unpaid upkeep, recovering from an injury or awaiting treatment costs to be paid, training a new skill or spell. Unavailable warriors cannot take part in missions. You can check warrior's availability status by selecting the warrior in the warband management section. Okay, so... This is two upkeep, I am assuming, and this is uh, two days of recovery because of an injury, I think. Hired Swords. Other than the default rank 0 warriors available to you for hire, you will eventually unlock higher ranked and new types of warriors to join your warband. These are called Hired Swords. While the default rank 0 warriors are always available for hire, the availability of higher ranked warriors will vary twice per week as the mercenaries come and go. Okay, so we can recruit already skilled warriors. 
if we have the money to do so. I think that will probably be more of an option in the later part of the game. Free Hired Swords. Several rewards will provide you with the opportunity to enlist the Hired Sword at no charge. Unlike other Hired Swords, these will never be removed from the list of available warriors until you hire them. Okay, so that looks like scripted characters that we can get. Uh, because of the story and such things. Okay, so it looks like that was the first hideout management tutorial. And apparently they are all just text. So let's just keep doing the next one, which is warrior management. Okay, so we've got description and injuries. This section displays all attributes of the selected warrior, along with the description which items it can equip, a list of perks if any, and the maximum amount you can have in your warband per type. These details can help you decide when hiring a warrior since they will impact its gameplay options. The injuries tab displays the injuries suffered by the warrior during its career adventuring in Mordheim. Okay, so we get lots of information here. Equipment. A warrior's equipment can be changed by selecting a slot to the left of the warrior. A list of items from your inventory that can be used in that slot will be displayed on the right side of the screen. You can also browse the store tab to buy items directly from the shop. Shops. So there's more than one. The slots on the right side of the warrior are for consumable items and can be equipped in the same way. So stuff like uh, that firebomb or the healing draught that we've seen in the combat tutorials. Items of fine, uh, blue or masterwork purple quality can be enchanted by selecting the enchanting tab once you have found some recipes. So there are weapons of different kind of, so different levels of weapons apparently. Uh, dual wheel two handed. The different melee weapon types have various effects when equipped on your warriors. One handed weapon only. Using a single one handed weapon will increase initiative by 10 so we are faster and dodge tense by chance by 10% due to an empty hand used for balance. So. That sounds pretty good if we want to make sure we act fast and hit reliably. One-handed weapon and shield. Using a shield allows the use of parry stance, which is also pretty nice. Two-handed weapon. These weapons have higher damage, but every subsequent attack after the first will apply a tiring debuff on the warrior, increasing the OP cost of melee attack skills by 1 and also reducing melee damage dealt by 20%. This effect is stackable and lasts until the warrior's next turn. So we deal more damage but it costs more to attack and also reduces the damage the more we do it. Dual wield. Dual wielding adds the damage of both weapons together. Like two-handed weapons, every subsequent attack will increase the OP cost of melee attack skills by one. However, dual wielding also reduces damage dealt by 30%. This damage reduction is applied after all other modifiers. So we get the damage of both weapons and then lose 30% of the overall damage. But it's probably still worth it. Or it can be worth it with the right weapons. Next is skills. This screen allows you to browse and train skills for a warrior. Skills already learned are displayed in the slots at the center of the screen. Slots on the left side of the character are for active skills, while slots on the right side are for passive skills. So we've got active and passive. A warrior can have up to five of each. Training skills require skill points, gold and, the s and several days of training time during which the warrior will be unavailable for missions. The warrior must also meet the attribute requirement for each skill. Available skills are displayed on the right side of the screen and are organized based on the 9 primary attributes. Once a skill has been trained, you can invest in mastery training for the same skill to enhance its effects. So we can learn skills and we can learn to get better in our skills. 
So next up is spells. Similar to skills, the spell tab displays the available spell uh, spells the caster can learn. So we've got that over there. There are no passive spells, only active ones that must be triggered. This tab is only accessible for warriors who can use magic, be it divine or arcane. Spells require spell points, gold and training time to learn. Spells also have a more powerful mastery version. Next is customization, bio. So the customization screen allows you to rename a warrior as you desire, name and surname in the same box. You may also write a biography for the warrior, but this will only be visible to you in the game. So you can add your own fluff, uh, fluff to the game and give your characters a backstory if you want to. Next up is the customization body parts. Each body part of a warrior can be customized independently. Only a few restrictions apply. If you wear armor, the torso will be locked into the armor type. So cloth, light or heavy. To reflect your equipment for other players. If you wear a helmet, no hats will be available and you will be locked with the helmet visual. Changes in customization will never affect the attributes of a warrior, so they are strictly cosmetic. For example, an arm customized with heavy armor visuals will offer no extra protection. And the last part of this tutorial is the customization of colors. Each body part of a warrior can be colored independently using a range of colors for each warband. And that's the warrior management. Um, let's keep going, I think. We are getting through them pretty well so let's just do at least one more so we've got the warrior attributes next first off are the base stats the base stats of the warrior are offense and strategy points covered in the combat tutorial in our very first one armor absorption directly reduces the damage taken from physical ranged and melee attacks and this does not impact spell damage then we've got damage, which is calculated based on the weapons equipped in the active slots as well as enchantments. After that we have critical hit chance, which is also based on equipped weapons and enchantments. And wounds, the amount of damage a warrior can take before falling out of action. So these are the base stats. Then we've got the attributes. Warriors have nine primary attributes, which are split into three categories, physical, mental and martial. These attributes can be selected in the warrior management screen to view more information on their effects. So I'm assuming they impact some of our other stats and stuff. As your warriors progress, they will gain either physical, mental or martial advancement, and you can decide which attribute should be increased. So we gather experience in these parts and can increase the value. Keep in mind that attributes also determine which skills the warrior can train. Okay, so there are prerequisites for the skills and we need to have points, specific uh, point value or higher to get to learn certain skills, apparently. Ah, wrong uh, arrow. Movement and initiative. The movement attribute determines how many meters can be moved per strategy point spent. It can only be modified through skills or enchantments. Initiative determines the order in which warriors will take actions during a combat round. It is modified based on the alertness attribute, armor and active weapons equipped along with their enchantments and skills of the warrior. So how fast we can act and how far we can move is affected by all these Parts. Morale stats. Warriors have two stats that impact morale in combat. Morale, <laughs> this value is based entirely on the leadership attribute and is combined with all warriors to form the warband's morale pool. Morale impact, this value is based on the warrior's type, leader, henchman, etc. and increases by one per warrior rank. When a warrior falls out of action in combat, their morale impact value is deducted from the warband's morale pool. 
If many of your warriors have, a, have low morale values compared to their morale impact values, you may find your warband routing very quickly. So the impact is a lot higher in this case, apparently. So that's why we uh, need to get the right balance in morale and morale impact, I'm assuming, if we have any influence on this at all. Uh, of course we do, we can increase leadership and uh, so on. So that's something to keep track of. Resistance part 1. Some resistance are applied to prevent an enemy f action from succeeding against the warrior. These resistances are melee, ranged and critical hit. So it's, uh, I'm guessing, yeah, so it's resistance as it says. For example, when an enemy performs a melee attack against you, your melee resistance will be subtracted from their hit chance. If the enemy has a 95% chance of hitting you and you have 30% melee resistance, there will be a 65% chance of the blow landing. So we can counteract, uh, counteract um, warriors that only wear one weapon, for example, um, with a high stat in resistance since they should hit us better but we could probably reduce that chance so that's interesting i think and of course we've got resistance part two the following resistances have a chance to completely nullify an effect dodge and parry so we can avoid a melee hit poison can nullify poison effect magic can nullify a spell effect Stun can nullify a stun effect. Wordstone can nullify the effects triggered when gathering wordstone. Trap can nullify the effects of a trap. All alone can nullify the effects of being outnumbered. And then we've got fear and terror, which can nullify the effect of fear and terror, obviously. So these resistances are always in effect with the exception of dodge and parry, which require the use of a stance to be in effect. Which we, of course, have already seen in the combat tutorials. Then we've got the warrior rating. The warrior's rating is based on several factors. The warrior type, leader, hero, henchman, impressive attributes, worth one rating per primary attribute point. Items equipped as well as their enchantments. Skills and spells worth 2 each and 4 for mastered versions. A warrior's rating value is only added to the warband's rating when the warrior is in, active, in an active slot. While they rest in the reserve or unavailable slots, their rating is not added to the warbands. So that's where our balance with the morale and morale impact comes from, I guess. <coughs> I think we have time to do one more, so we get through half of the hideout management tutorials. So let's do Smuggler's Den. There are three, three factions. There will always be three options when you decide to sell your gathered wordstones. The primary faction is your main sponsor in more time. In return they demand regular shipment requests and will send you on unique missions. And then there are two secondary factions that are also interested in buying your wordstones and will provide rewards the more you deal with them. So it looks like we can build up a reputation and I'm assuming that the higher our reputation with the faction, the better the probable or the possible rewards will be. Wordstones and reputations. Selling wordstones to a faction will provide you with two rewards. First one is reputation with the faction, which will increase its affinity towards you. More on this later, apparently. And second, payment in gold crowns, which will be received several days after the shipment has been sent. Okay, so that's where probably where we get most of our income from to keep our warband running and buy new warriors. Multiple shipments, shipments sent on the same day to the same faction will be compiled together in the daily report. Okay, so it doesn't matter if we send one big shipment or several small shipments. 
Wordstone requests. Okay, so our primary faction sponsors our expedition in more time and allows us to keep everything we find. In exchange, they request constant Wordstone shipments. The Wordstones you send to cover this debt are paid at only 50% of the worth, the other 50% being held to cover extra fees. So that's pretty steep fee, to be honest. These requests must be fulfilled within a specific time frame and they do not provide a reputation reward. Failing to deliver a request on time will cancel the current request and replace it with a larger shipment. You can still gain reputation with your primary sell by selling extra wordstones beyond the requested shipment. Okay, so we can't get reputation on our primary faction as easily because we have a required quota and only uh, everything above that counts towards it. So that probably won't be as easy to get. Failure consequences. Shipment requests from your faction are of particular importance. Failing to fulfill a request in this uh, in time will result in severe warnings that can take many forms. Failing four times will cause your faction to retract their sponsorship. In other words, your campaign is over. You will not be able to progress your current warband any further. It will stay in its current state forever. However, you may still use the warband in exhibition matches. So, I don't know if there is an actual end to the campaign or if it's just um, pretty much open end until we fail enough shipments. But that's a very interesting mechanic, I think. So it puts a lot of pressure on us to keep our shipment dates. Reputation rewards. When you acquire enough reputation with the faction, your faction rank will rise and provide immediate rewards. Ranks and their associated rewards can be seen on the right side of the screen. So here we see what bonuses we get in when we uh, rise in rank. So for example, apparently at rank 4 we would get our full market price for Wordstone requests and stuff like that, so that looks pretty profitable. And the last point of this tutorial is the faction rank effects. When a faction rank is gained, its impact it impacts all factions in the following ways. The faction gaining the rank will reduce the gold paid for Wordstone by 10% down to a minimum of 80% of their worth due to high stock. However, the reputation required to reach the next rank is reduced by 10% as a token of gratitude. Other factions will increase the gold paid for Wordstone by 20% of their own worth due to high demand. However, the reputation required to reach the next rank is increased by 5% due to your dealings with a rival faction. So that's an interesting dynamic. So we either can gain a lot of rank easier when we donate uh, when we go with one faction the whole time but we get less money or we can abuse the system the other way and uh, get more money for our Wordstone shipments but don't get as much a reputation so that's a cool dynamic as well i think and that's the smugglers den tutorial so we got through four of eight hideout management tutorials and i think we will leave it at that it was a is a lot of information to digest and I think we will grow into all of the intricacies of the system once we actually get to the a campaign. And I'm really looking forward to that. So in the next video, we will do the four last remaining tutorials. And after that, we will finally get going with our campaign. And I hope you will stick with me until then and enjoy what is to come. So. If you already did enjoy what was what was happening today and learned a bit a little bit uh, i would appreciate a comment or a like and if you want to hear more of me and see more of more time or blood bowl or anything else that might come here just subscribe <laughs> and that's it for today as always thanks for tuning in and i hope you will do so next time bye